This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 9th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the governor shows some movement in the administration's presentation to the Fiscal Policy Working Group, but we explain why, in our view, he's limiting the options too tightly. Second, in his presentation, ICER head Ralph Townsend hits the exact right notes, but we question whether anyone is listening. Third, we discuss some interesting conjecture around Oil Search's PICA project with some upsides and downsides for Alaska. And now, let's join Michael. Let's talk about what you're uh, what you're good at here, analyzing what's going on with the state. Um, we got a couple. We got the weekly top three, and the first two both deal with the uh, working group. The first is the Department of Revenue presentation to the working group. Uh, give us uh, give us your thoughts on what's been happening over in the uh, little uh, little company of eight, the gang of eight there. Well, this is I'm gonna. Uh, say good things about the governor here for a little bit, and then I'll say something not so good. But uh, <laughs> last last Thursday, uh, Department of Revenue uh, gave a presentation to the working group, which was uh, a significant departure from where the govern for where, where the administration had been before, both in terms of fiscal outlook uh, and in terms of how to close the uh, uh, the deficit. Uh, the the there, there were two things in the presentation that were that were important to me. Uh, the presentation only got about halfway through before they had broadband issues down in southeast, so they cut the hearing short, um, and it will continue today uh, uh, at at the Tuesday meeting of the working group. So people who want to sort of catch up with it can can listen today um, or watch it today. But the two things that I think were significant was one, the, the, the administration significantly changed um, its fiscal outlook. Uh, it did it in several ways. Uh, one was it updated uh, near-term oil prices. The spring revenue forecast had predicted uh, $61 uh, this coming year. We've been hovering uh, in the high 60, 70, low $70 range, um, and the administration updated uh, the forecast for uh, oil prices both this year and next year. Um, and they also uh, updated the spending uh, numbers uh, in the spring forecast and what the administration had, the position the administration had been taking up to last Thursday. Uh, there had been these unspecified spending cuts that had been uh, worked into the fiscal presentation it is so in a way to reduce the deficit, to reduce the apparent deficit by right. by uh, creating some, some unspecified uh, spending cuts. They took those out largely um, and showed uh, an increase in spending that is, that is higher – than where they were before. Now, it doesn't come up all the way to the alleged finance um, uh, projection of, of, uh, of the current law uh, spending levels, if we continue under current law, what those spending levels would be. Uh, it falls short of that. So there's still some implicit spending cuts uh, built into the, uh, the updated fiscal plan, but it does at least take out 
some of the unspecified uh, spending cuts that they had been relying on uh, before. The consequence of that is to narrow the deficit uh, this year and this fiscal year, FY22, and next fiscal year because of the increase um, in uh, uh, in oil revenues. Uh, but to show bigger deficits than they had been showing before uh, in the out years. I, I would say those out year deficits are still um, uh, artificially low because while they updated the oil prices for this year and next year to reflect uh, uh, current market conditions, what the what the futures basically what the futures market is 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 telling us about oil prices, they didn't update the out years. So while the futures market says by the end of the decade we're at fifty nine dollar oil, uh, the fiscal plan still has still is predicated on seventy one dollar oil. So we've still got we've still got that problem. But I but it's more it's more realistic. The 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 fiscal outlook that they've got now is more realistic and I think uh, uh, closer to giving us a, a clearer picture, at least in the near term, closer, closer to giving us a, 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 a clear picture of what we're facing. The other thing, um, and this is this is the one that uh, we'll, we'll get more developed in today's presentation, um, the, the, today's continuation of, of the presentation, uh, is that they included a number of revenue options. Um, the governor has been, as, as I've talked about on the show, complained on the show repeatedly. Uh, the governor has has not brought forward uh, up to up to Thursday had not brought forward proposed revenue options right. uh, to to close the deficit. That's been your biggest, and, and that's been your biggest complaint about his plan the whole time. SGR six and everything else is that there is no option for filling the revenue holes that are remaining. Uh, he keeps sending it back to them, and and uh, he says whack a mole, but you say he's not really providing any real, <laughs> concrete, substantive options. Yeah, he's never he's never he's never whacked one mole. I mean, it's not it's not whackables. He's, he's never he's never come forward as I think the governor has a responsibility to do. Uh, he's never come forward with uh, with revenue options in the Thursday presentation. Um, he comes forward with, or the administration comes forward with a number of revenue options, um, including, uh, I think, uh, uh, significantly, uh, a proposal uh, with respect to uh, redoing uh, oil uh, taxes, um, closing the gap on uh, or, or redoing the corporate tax to capture corporate tax from Hillcorp. Um, we had, a, we, 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 we received a corporate taxes from BP because of Hillcorp's corporate uh, uh, corporate form, um, and and the way our tax code, our corporate tax code is written, Hillcorp would not have paid any corporate taxes. He proposes a reform uh, that uh, that does that. Uh, he uh, puts some pen to paper or pencil to paper with uh, with respect to the sales taxes that uh, Mike Shower has talked about. He gives some numbers for uh, what uh, uh, gaming. Uh, casinos, lotteries, internet gaming uh, might raise in revenue. It's not much. Um, talks about a, a, a change to the corporate income tax to capture uh, corporate income taxes from digital businesses like Amazon and Netflix and others that operate in the state. Um, talks about something that I don't think anybody's been talking about before, which is selling carbon offsets, um, uh, essentially setting aside Alaska lands to to act as carbon, carbon offsets to uh, – uh, the carbon production elsewhere, uh, and then talks about the motor fuel tax. So there's a number there's a number of revenue options um, that they model, uh, and um, and the uh, the presentation indicates they'll put the models up on the the DOR website um, that they model that really you know brings some bring some revenue. Uh, options forward. So I've got to I've got to say, given all the criticism that I've that I've uh, used uh, with the governor over the past several months about not uh, uh, pr pr proposing revenues, uh, I've got to say that uh, that the this this administration or this presentation, at least from the administration, uh, is bringing some forward. Now, um, I, I I will continue to criticize. The administration for not bringing forward what I think are fair, equitable, low-impact 
um, low uh, economic impact uh, revenue proposals. The sales, as we've talked about on the show, the sales tax, sales taxes are like uh, the PFD in the sense that they're regressive. They take more from middle and lower income Alaska families than they do from the from the top 20 percent. Because they're regressive, they also have an adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. They take more money out of the Alaska economy uh, than, uh, than than more equitable proposals. And so I think I think there's a way to a, a ways to go uh, in in developing an equitable uh, revenue approach. But I've got to say, uh, the governor at least has stepped up in, in this presentation. Uh, the the administration steps up in terms of putting. Uh, some revenue proposals on the table, um, uh, even if I don't, uh, even if even if they're not perfect from my standpoint, at least he's in the game uh, in terms of uh, of putting re- revenue proposals on well, the table. Well, and that's always been the that's always been the comment, right? I mean, at least present something, even if it gets destroyed. At least you've put something forward, and they can't say. I mean, from a political standpoint, the legislature can't go, oh, it's all pie in the sky because you haven't presented us any options. Here's a plethora of options to choose from. These are what my suggestions are. What do you got? Now it truly is a game of whack-a-mole. They can come back and they can smack each one of these down. Uh, You know, I noticed that there was no discussion, uh, unless I missed it in what you were just saying, on the SB57, the uh, oil tax uh, uh, property infrastructure tax that's on the uh, North Slope and on the Pipeline Corridor. Um, but, I mean, there's options there at least. That's what he should have been, you know, that's what he should have been doing from the very beginning. Yeah, it's uh, he's late to the game, certainly is late to the game in doing this. I mean, as I've, as I've talked about before, the governor has, not, has a responsibility to present a balanced budget. His has had holes in it. He hasn't presented anything to close them. Now he has. Um, uh, and I think it's, uh, I, I think he deserves, the administration deserves credit for doing that. And I think the administration deserves credit for a more, a more realistic, I won't, I won't say yet it's fully realistic, but a more realistic uh, fiscal outlook, not yet fully realistic, because I think it's, it's relying on oil prices in the out years and oil production levels in the out years uh, that, um, that are stretch, uh, maybe beyond stretch. Uh, uh, in terms of in terms of you know whether we whether we're going to realize them, but, but nonetheless, way. nonetheless, it's it's a it's a it's a forward step in terms of having a more realistic uh, fiscal outlook. So I, I, I give the administration credit uh, for uh, uh, for for taking the step of both on the both on the fiscal outlook and on uh, coming forward with revenue. This is kind of a pleasant surprise to see that the governor's office is actually uh, trying to present something. Uh, is it too little too late? I mean, really, at this point, I mean, we were talking about this, you know, back in May. I mean, we were talking about this in late April, early May. I mean, we should have been there should have been, you know, revenue presentations attached to his discussions on SGR. I think people would have taken it more seriously if he would at least even if they hated the revenue idea. They would have at least taken it more seriously if he attached some revenue ideas to it. And where is SB 57, by the way? Well, let me take the first first and the second second. Um, too little, too late. Um, it's late. I mean, we, we've <laughs> how long have we been in this fiscal crisis? How long has Governor Dunleavy been governor? How long has he been talking about these unspecified unspecified holes in the in the uh, uh, in the in his fiscal outlook? Uh, it's late, uh, and and it certainly would be good if we could have been talking about these going into last year's regular session. Would have been good if we could have been talking about them over the summer uh, before going into uh, uh, this. Uh, the the working group uh, would have been good if we could have been talking about it since the first of the working group. Um, but you know, it's 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 better late than never, uh, I guess, uh, is what I would say. Uh, we've got a special session coming up. The governor has laid uh, uh, some revenues on the table. At least we can now talk about. At least the governor's administration. At least the administration isn't saying uh, we don't need revenues. We've got all these unspecified cuts out there. Um, and at least we can have. We, we, we will have a discussion about uh, uh, about revenues. And there's some there's some stuff in the governor's presentation. I mean, oil taxes. I mean, the governor's proposing a move on oil taxes. Not a big move. Not a huge amount of dollars. Doesn't close the the deficit. But uh, but oil taxes. Um, and um, and and. And, and, you know, uh, we're, we're going to have sales taxes on the table. One of the sales tax proposals, I've got a lot of questions about. It actually might be 
okay. There's no distributional analysis with it, so you don't know uh, what the effect is on Alaskans, and we'll we'll talk about that in the in the second segment coming up. But you know, it, there's it's interesting. The South Dakota proposal is interesting. It's huge. I mean, it's got a it's got a tax base of 32 an implied tax base of 32 billion dollars. Most of the tax bases that we've talked about before sales tax bases have been like 15 17 billion dollars. So there's a huge tax base that it's that it's that it's projecting out there. If that is spread um uh, uh equitably um maybe that's a maybe that's something to think about going forward. So I mean he's got he's put some proposals on the table that are worth thinking about. Late, very late, very very late in the game. Uh but um but but you know worth it. On uh, SB 57, is that the right number? Yeah, SB 57. I, you know, in all honesty, and I'm sure I'm going to get killed in the chat room over this, but in all honesty, that's a non-starter. I mean, it it takes money away from the North Slope Borough, takes money away from uh, rural Alaska, from, from one of the big parts of rural Alaska. Politically, uh, that's just going to be very difficult to do. I mean, it's, it's sort of like, it's sort of the next version of PCE, right? We've seen the pushback on PCE uh, from, uh, from you know, the, the, the impact of, of, of that cut right. uh, and how much bu- bu- uh, 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 rural Bush Alaska's pushback. I think the same thing happens with SB 57 if that gets put back on the table. Well, it's too bad because I think, I mean, we're talking about $440 million dollars that uh, I think should be captured uh, back in. But you're right. It's going to be a lot of pushback from the North Slope, from the Fairbanks North Star Borough, from the Valdez Borough. I mean, there's a lot of pushback along that whole corridor. But, uh, I mean, I think it is the right thing to do since, it's uh, since you know, if it's collectively we all own it, then that should be part of it. But we'll, especially considering the size of the permanent fund for the North Slope Borough that they have for themselves, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty astonishing. Um, yeah, I just, I just don't think the governor, I mean, the fact it's not in his revenue proposals, yeah. I, I just don't think the governor wants well, to take that on. Yeah. And I agree with you that p- politically it's a non-starter. I mean, it's just, you know, you saw that cause he, he already proposed it and the reaction was meh. And they just kind of moved on. They didn't even look at it. They didn't even, I don't think he'd even got a hearing. Um, it was just so, uh, basically, um, uh, it was, you know, basically so derided. They didn't even give it a hearing. So. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Number two is also dealing with a working group, this time with the ICER presentation. We're about 90 seconds out, Brad, so give us a tease going into the next segment. The ICER presentation, I thought, was a was a great presentation. Ralph Townsend, who's the head of ICER, uh, uh, made, the, uh, made the presentation, talked about uh, revenue options and, and, and the issues you need to think about with revenue options. I think he laid down uh, great fundamentals that I'll talk about. Uh, in the segment, the question that I have is: Is anybody listening right, <laughs> to, right. to to what he's saying? And we'll talk about uh, why I'm concerned. About and that. and ICER, for those of you who don't know, is the Institute for Socioeconomic Research at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and they have been a key player in this debate for the last ten years, right, Brad? I mean, this has been something they've been going over for ten or twelve years now. Oh, longer than that. I mean, this is where Scott Goldsmith was. I right. Mean, this is this this is. This was Scott Goldsmith's home uh, through the 80s and 90s and, and 2000s and early two, two, 2010s where he did the research. I mean, last right. night I was still I was going back to a Goldsmith presentation that they did in 85. Uh, right. So, yeah, icer has been in this game a long time. Long, long time. We are now working on to number two, which is also a discussion on the working group. This time the presentation by the Institute for Socioeconomic Research known as ICER in the University of Alaska Anchorage. We've been following uh, their stuff for quite a while. They've really reached prominence starting in 2013-14 when they were being loud and proud about, you know, you have to reduce the size and scope of government to this level to make it sustainable. Brad and I were really hammering on that for quite a few years, and everybody was like, "Uh uh-huh, oh, yeah, sure, that sounds great. And then, of course, nothing happened. Uh, So it leads back to his question, is anybody listening? Is anybody actually? listening brad the presentation by icer to the working group your thoughts excellent presentation by ralph townsend the head of uh the head of icer uh following on the in the tradition of scott goldsmith who uh, was was prominent uh in talking about these issues back in the two tw- early 20 teens the period that you were that you were talking about um and others who have talked uh, from icer uh over the years both before and um and and since that time 
Ralph, uh, Ralph made, I, Ralph summarized essentially the 2016 ICER study that, that I've talked about on the show a number of times, and he really drove home two points. One, uh, how you close the gap, uh, how you close our deficit uh, has an impact on the overall Alaska economy, and it has an impact on Alaska families, the two points, two key points that come out of the 2016 study. And, 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 and what I really liked about Ralph's presentation was that he stressed uh, the who pays issue that 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 perhaps the most important well indeed the most important decision that the that the working group the legislature the administration uh, makes uh, in in closing that gap is who pays who pays for closing that gap who, what's the distributional impact what income bracket what income segment what industry uh, pays uh, for for closing uh, uh, that deficit. Um, and and you will have different impacts on the overall Alaska economy uh, depending upon who pays. If you push it to middle and lower income Alaska families, that has a larger adverse uh, impact on the Alaska economy than if you than if you spread it more broadly uh, over all Alaska families. The, the 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 problem or the challenge here is, and the reason I say you know the question is who's listening to uh, is anybody listening to uh, to the ICER presentation. In order to understand the who pays issue, you've got to do a distributional analysis for, for the various revenue options. You've got to look at how that revenue option impacts Alaska families by income bracket. Uh, we have an ITAP, uh, a, a study from 2017 by the Institute uh, of Taxation and Economic Policy that came in and looked at a number of revenue options, did a distributional analysis for each of those revenue options told us which ones were regressive, which ones were progressive, which ones were relatively flat, um, uh, and, and really gives us a lot of detail. But as you, as you step through the revenue options, you've got to look at what those distributional impacts are, who pays, in order to understand what the impact of that revenue option is on Alaska families and understand what the impact is on Alaska on the Alaska economy. And the reason I said the reason I raise the issue is anybody listening is because right after ICER's presentation on that very issue, on that core issue on Tuesday, the administration comes in with its presentation on Wednesday, has has the revenue options uh, listed that we talked about in the last segment, but no distributional analysis so you don't know who's paying um you, you know you know in lump sum what the dollars are that you get out of that revenue option but you don't know who's providing those dollars so you don't know whether it's it's middle and lower income alaska families with an adverse impact on the alaska economy whether it's upper income alaska families you know with you know with the oil tax that it's going to be a, a that oil and the oil industry is going to pay that but that's a relatively minor part of the overall uh, of the overall distribution, so it, it, they've got a they got a great presentation from ICER on Tuesday. Really need to take it to heart. That's the fundamental. That's the baseline of how you analyze in the other 49 states and at the federal level. That's the baseline of how you analyze uh, uh, revenue measures. Um, but you know, it's just it, it, it's like I, I know Kevin's on here, and I and and I don't want to be highly critical of the of the working group but it's like it just went right over their heads i mean or when and it's like it went over the administration's head it's like it's like yeah yeah thanks great presentation thank you very much for taking the time to do it thanks for laying all this stuff out down thanks for uh, thanks for uh, for educating us but next <laughs> right right and and it's just i mean we're not going to get to a good answer we may get to an answer but we're not going to get to a good solid answer of what's best for Alaska families and what's best for the overall Alaska economy if we don't do the distributional analyses. And 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 one of the really disappointing things about, about the administration coming forward with these revenue measures, great that we've got revenue measures. Congratulations for finally stepping up and putting revenue measures on the floor. But if you don't do a distributional analysis around those revenue measures, you're not telling us much. You're telling us in lump sum what the dollars are, but you're not telling us who's paying those dollars. And without knowing who's paying those dollars, we don't know the economic impact and we don't know what we're doing to Alaska families. 
Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. So what's your solution here, Brad? I mean, that they need to basically pay attention and include. I mean, distributional analysis is not the one and done. It's not the only thing that you use, but it is a tool in the toolbox as you look at a tax. I mean, you have to, somebody in the chat room just said distributional analysis is not how you pick taxes. You pick taxes based on revenue generation and administrative costs. You pick a tax based on the least disturbing choice sets, but it's part of it. I mean, it's a big, it's like having a three-legged stool and somebody took the third leg out. I mean, you've got to have all three of those things, you know, the revenue generation, the administrative costs, and the distributional analysis to be able to handle it. And if you don't have it, you're missing a huge chunk of the factor on how which one is the best? Well, that's just that's just a, a very poor analysis of what of what you look for. You need to you need to know who you're impacting. You need to know what segments of the of 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 uh, of, of your family set that you're that you're impacting, and that's important not only because you're concerned about equity, but but it's also what drives economic impact. You don't know you don't know the economic impact of a revenue proposal if you don't know the distributional analysis. You don't know it. I mean, you, 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 can, you can guess at it, but you don't know it because you don't know what families you're taking, you're taking money away, away from. So you can't, you, can't do a, you can't do a revenue proposal without, you can't know what you're doing with a revenue proposal without doing the distributional analysis. It, it, is, not, it is not the only thing you look at but it is certainly at the core of what you look at because it tells you which families you're impacting, which segments of your, of your, of your uh, uh, community you're, you're impacting, and it tells you what you're doing in terms of the economic impact. And without that, you're flying blind. You're flying, you're flying into a fog, blank, fog bank uh, using visual rules as opposed to instrument rules. Right. Uh, yeah, you may be able to land the plane, but <laughs> the odds of it being a successful landing are not great. Right. Um, and that and that's exactly what you're doing if you don't have a distributional analysis. Uh, Patton said decision making is easy once you have all the facts. And I think that's you need you know, you need to understand all of those things. You can't just you can't just leave the ones off that don't favor what you want to do. You have to look at everything in total instead of bits and pieces. And I think that's what they're doing right now. They're ignoring one obvious leg of this stool for sure. Um all right, let's uh, move on. Uh, Pika, some interesting thoughts on Pika will be number three. Pika is in play. So Pika is the is the uh, the the big new uh, oil field, one of the big new oil fields that have been discovered on the slope that that people talk about as providing uh, volumes that not only would offset uh, declines but actually increase uh, production from the North Slope uh, above the 500 million level. 500 million a day level that we've been uh, the 500,000 a day level, uh, excuse me, that we've been running at uh, for the last uh, for the last several years. Um, and Pika, Pika and Willow are the two big oil fields up there. The reason I keep talking about Pika uh, is because it's so important to uh, to the production outlook uh, uh, of the state. It's been it's owned by Oil Search right now. It's owned by Oil Search, as we talked about, la or, or operated by Oil Search, owned by Oil Search and Repsol. Um, but but oil search is the driver. And last week we talked about the fact that oil search is now uh, 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 looks like it's going to merge with a company called Santos, which has a, a strictly Australian and Southeast Asian uh, focus. Really has never been outside that region. Um, is unlikely to, to to go outside that region. So uh, the question is, what happens in that merger to Pika? There was an article in Petroleum News uh, Weekly, which I found fascinating, speculating on who potentially might pick up uh, Pika. Um, and one of the one of the parties they speculated is ConocoPhillips. Um, ConocoPhillips, you know, Pika, sort of right in the middle of two ConocoPhillips uh, projects, would be easy for ConocoPhillips to uh, to incorporate. Uh, uh, into its into its operations, ConocoPhillips in the past uh, has been has been rumored to have looked at uh, participating in Pika, but has never pulled the pulled the 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 the, the trigger on that. Um, and and part of the reason is price. I mean, I, Oil Search and, and and Repsol have valued Pika at a relatively high value, uh, and and have, and have not looked at it. So. Uh, Conoco may be looking at it. Uh, there's some good things and some bad things. We'll do that. Uh, we'll do that in the break. Uh, but it's a uh, it's an it's an intriguing uh, potential 
that Pika might land with ConocoPhillips uh, uh, as a result of the merger. And that would be essentially almost landing on our feet at that point because the big fear, of course, is that Santos, with no Alaska-centric uh, vision, uh, would just let that prog project languish and basically we would lose one of the big uh, future profit centers that the state has been looking for and counting on for many years. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, and but there's some downsides with Conoco too, and we'll we'll talk about those uh, in the break. Pros and cons of Conoco getting involved in the Pika project, because again, this has been the you know this is what a lot of uh, people have been hanging their hat on for future revenues here in the state. Pika plays a big part of that, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest from outside players to capital uh, you know capitalize that project and to invest in it. And uh, you know Santos, uh, it doesn't look good if Santos decides to pick that up. Uh, so pros and cons of uh, of Con of uh, Conoco uh, moving on into it. Yeah, the reason the reason that 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 Conoco hasn't I think moved on Pika, uh, taken an interest in Pika before is because of price. Um, uh, Repsol and, and and particularly Oil Search put a fairly high value on that prospect, and and so the price was pretty steep. But what happens in a merger? Been through a few of these. What happens in a merger? is the, the incoming, incoming company has no stake in a particular property. Uh, it, it's outside their scope. It's something they've never been involved in before. Um, and so as part of doing the, they, they're, they're doing the merger because they want other properties uh, that the company owns. Oil Search has a big, has big LNG projects in uh, Pow Pow, New Guinea. And uh, that's really what uh, Santos is interested in. So what happens in a merger is you 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 tell you if you're the if you're the surviving company the merging company you say well you know i just got to get rid of this thing because i'm never going to develop it whatever i get out of it is fine whatever value i get out of it is fine i'll write off the remainder and uh, you know i'll say that you know previous management didn't know what they were doing about it or something like that and just and write it off as part of the uh, as part of the merger process and 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 that's a tried and true thing that's done so the the value the price on the pika on Pika isn't going to go to zero, but Santos, if, if this merger is completed, Santos is going to have a lot less at stake in terms of pride and in terms right. of corporate out overview. So the good, good, good and the bad news of, if, of, of, if Conoco does it, Conoco knows the, knows the, 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 the area, they know the, the, the environment in which they're dealing with Pika is right next to theirs. They have the existing infrastructure they can use that would significantly reduce the cost, potentially significantly reduce the cost of development, um, reduce the, reduce the overall footprint, uh, as a result of the, as a result of the project, uh, they have Conoco has the financial wherewithal to, to, to complete it. One of the things we've talked about before, uh, is that oil search really didn't have a good financial base and so it was going to it was going to be stretchy for them to uh, complete it positives in terms of, be, of being able to complete it the downside is is sort of the same downside that we talked about a lot in the state in the year 2000 when bp proposed to take over arco uh, and bp would become the the big dog uh, on the slope you're putting a lot of the state's eggs in one basket one of the one of the benefits of pika uh, was that we were going to get a new player on the slope, oil search and Repsol. We were going to get new insights, new development, new uh, uh, activity, uh, uh, just a different way of looking at things that uh, that that you know gave us a better a better insight. Indeed, Pika came about because Armstrong, the uh, the previous owner of the of the prospect, just came in totally out of the blue, uh, totally out of the out of the air, just took a li different look at Alaska and found this prospect that BP and, and Conoco had had never found. So it's good to have new players in. And if Conoco acquires uh, Pika, then you then you just put another egg in the basket of one of your existing players, a good player, solid player, player who's contributed a lot, player who knows the who knows the uh, the area and has the capability, but nevertheless an existing player, uh, and um, and and you you know you 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 become more dependent on Conoco uh, as opposed to sort of hedging your bets by having a having a third party operator in there. Those were the same issues we went through in 2000 when BP proposed to uh, to acquire Arco, uh, and there was a lot of pushback from the state. 
Well, we'll have to see. Uh, Brian, I think you just answered most of his question. He said, why would they let it languish, meaning Oil Search or Santos? Why would they let it languish? And basically because it's not their focus factor. It's not why they're uh, trying to purchase Oil Search. Um, and, and literally what you just said is they'd probably be willing to fire sale it because they've got nothing invested either emotionally, monetarily, or anything else other than they're trying to assume these companies and they want all the other assets. So, I mean, it's a fire sale, so Conoco could pick it up. Otherwise, oil search would probably just, I mean, they would let it languish because it would split the focus on what their vision is for the company moving forward, what Santos would do anyway. Yeah, exactly right. Companies get very focused on what, I mean, they, they focus on what they're good at. Um, I mean, Conoco wouldn't go search in Antarctica, for example, because they have no, not only is there not any oil down in Antarctica, but, but they don't have any experience down there. And Santos is the same way. Santos is hyper-focused on Australia uh, and uh, in Southeast Asia. They know what they're good at. They're a gas-focused company. Uh, Pika is an oil play. It's just not, it's just not in their scope. So, if they if they can if they would continue to hold on it they continue to talk good things about it but that'd be to talk up the price it wouldn't be to really uh, develop it um, Pika moving if this if San, if the Santos merger goes through Pika moving to somebody else is 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 probably a very very important thing for Alaska to uh, to encourage right and again like I said and like you said this kind of is almost like the fire sale right we're we're liquidating everything we don't really want and so this is an opportunity for Conoco to pick it up for uh you know not pennies on the dollar but for a, a deeply discounted price from what uh it had been valued by for oil search because they were so heavily invested in it yep exactly right okay. exactly right well brad um as always thank you for coming in uh, interesting discussion and we got a lot to think about here we appreciate you coming on board and joining us thanks for uh, being part of it today as always michael as always thanks for having me appreciate appreciate you coming in well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.